Welcome to Mock the Week. I'm Dara O'Brien. and joining me this week are Andy Parsons, Holly Walsh and Russell Howard, Jack Whitehall, Hugh Dennis and Milton Jones. We start with a round called Headliners. Here's a picture of a packed House of Commons recently, but what does PTFC stand for? Is it Pissed Tossers Face Chop? <laughs> Is it Parliament Too Few Chairs? <laughs> Is it, in fact, just everything that they've spent money on? Porn, televisions, furniture, <laughs> castles. <laughs> Is it Perspective Temp's 15-foot cameraman? <laughs> Is it Politicians Turn Out for Free Cakes? <laughs> Is it about the least recognisable man in politics? Politicians try and find Clegg. <laughs> Or is it, they're actually playing a game, pick the fattest Conservative? <laughs> <laughs> is it, in fact, the new Labour car scrappage scheme, Prioritas Toyotas for Conservatives? <laughs> Imagine how good that'd be if I managed to say Prius and Toyota. <laughs> is it, uh... Actually, I drive a Priotus. Uh, yeah. uh, the handling is incredible. Yeah. Mm. Is it, you drive uh... my new Priotus, darling, <laughs> yes. Uh, it goes not a sickety. Uh, <laughs> Or is it, uh, performers try find caption? <laughs> is it? OK, the, uh, the P is for payback. Payback time. time. Payback for... the fucking cash! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a proper cri de coeur, wasn't it? Yeah, that yeah, came yeah. from the heart. <laughs> I want to know which paper that comes from, because I'd like to read that every day. <laughs> It's the Parsons Gazette. So every article's the same. Look at these assholes! <laughs> hey, not that particular, but the pay payback one. Payback time for Commons. Well done, very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, the answer I was looking for was payback time for Commons. This is the news that MPs have been ordered to repay over £1 million of their expenses following an audit of claims dating back to 2004. How do we feel about the MP oh, so. <laughs> It just refuses to go away, this story, doesn't it? It's like thrush every time you open the paper. It's back. I'm fed up with hearing certain MPs say, it's legal, it's legal. So standing outside an old folks home dressed as Harold Shipman, just don't do it. <laughs> they have paid back supposedly over a million pounds, but the inquiry itself cost one and a half million pounds. <laughs> yeah. And what was not covered in the... Uh, in this, in the in... The leg report, about it. What, what wasn't covered? Oh, the second houses. Second houses, the yeah. flipping of houses. The, the, big, the big story. The thing that people got really it. angry about, the flipping houses wasn't in the flipping report. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's actually just stuff like travel expenses. I mean, there was, a, there was a league table in The Guardian during the week of the five MPs who've taken the most in travel expenses. And coincidentally, it was the MP for Orkney. <laughs> the MP for the Shetland Isles. And you kind of go, that's probably fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Favourite expense like, without... My favourite expense without doubt, there was one MP that allegedly claimed five grand for stationery? <laughs> what, what does he write on? Dried unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was one bloke, wasn't there? He claimed to have his hedge trimmed around his helipad. And you're thinking, why on earth do you need a hedge <laughs> around your helipad? And surely, if you use that helipad often enough, <laughs> it should trim the hedge <laughs> for <laughs> but what annoys me, though, as well, is the way that they kind of thought that we'd, like, forget about it. It's like, we're not. You like, Screw them. Every single one of those, like, greedy bastards use their expensive claims to pay for, like, tennis coaches for their wife who's getting screwed into oblivion behind their own back. Or <laughs> the school fees for their posh, yuppie daughter, Tara Misalata, who got a Porsche before she hit puberty and completely and utterly neglect the lives of their sons that have failed performing arts degrees <laughs> and use fleeting panel show appearances as a desperate cry for help. What was uh, Cameron's response, by the way? It's he, awful, it's uh, bloody awful. It's an absolute disgrace, Well, he had to tone it down, because he also it's was tied by the same rules. Yeah, yeah. Only a little bit. But the thing is, you can't have Cameron sort of lecturing us about money, because he's so posh. When he was little, he didn't have an action man, he had a Gurkha. <laughs> <laughs> he, said that, he said that it was out of order for, uh, for Brown to, uh, to complain about the expenses, because he said, Gordon Brown cannot reform the institution, because he is the institution. <laughs> <laughs> Which is meant as a bit of a zinger, but... If anyone ever said that, I would be around number 10 in my pants going, 
and the institution. Yeah. Are you the institution? Oh, you're not the institution. I am the institution. Who's, that? Who's, that? Who's the institution? I'm the institution, yeah! Who, how's Gordon Brown be preparing for the election? He's been eating nine bananas. Nine bananas. No. Nine bananas. Whoa, 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 sorry, sorry, here, yeah. First off, he had a Kit Kat obsession. He's replaced the Kit Kats with bananas, which I think is a great shame. Because yep. Kit Kats, he's getting a subliminal message that we all want him to have. Have a break. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, being photographed eating fruit is a bad idea because that immediately alienates your Scottish voters. Yeah. So, <laughs> the, thing, the thing about bananas, though, isn't it? Is it supposed to convert into serotonin, which makes you happy? Now, he has nine bananas a day. Imagine how miserable he would look <laughs> if he wasn't eating those bananas. Presumably, he likes bananas so he can fit one in sideways to make it look like he's smiling. <laughs> What, what Gordon Brown, though, is doing with the bananas, he's cutting them up very, very fine, then cooking them in oil. And I said to him, listen, mate, you're frittering your life away. <laughs> what has added this week to car manufacturer Toyota's troubles? Ah, now, this is a recall. They've had to recall the second car. They may have... They may, they have, may to have, have to do recall, it, but yeah. it does the whole thing. It explains to me one of the great mysteries in advertising. The car in front is a Toyota because its accelerator is stuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'd imagine a better, yeah, ad now, a better ad now would be, the car behind you is a Toyota, <laughs> I'd get out of its way. Yeah. <laughs> the other day, right, when I read the headline, Faulty Toyota's Record, I was like, brilliant. That's my favourite Japanese sitcom. <laughs> <laughs> Toyota, Toyota owners have been That's told... a good joke, yeah. come on. <laughs> Faulty Toyotas. I was then going to go on and do an impression of Dark Mantra and a War, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> have been told, haven't they, to take their 40 cars back to the garage. Now, you're thinking that's probably a little bit dangerous for the garage owners. You know, <laughs> looking at, oh, my God, here's one coming. <laughs> Looks like it's coming a bit quickly. <laughs> Quick, behind the wall, behind the wall. Yeah, if the garage you're bringing it back to is called Cliffside Motors. Uh, <laughs> they, said, they said as well that if you take it back, they can fix it in, like, half an hour. Yeah. I always get worried about how easy they can seem to do these things because it really scares me. Like, I was on a plane the other day and I was sat on it for like half an hour and after half an hour, the guy came on the PA system and he was like, don't be alarmed, in a couple of moments the cabin's going to go quiet whilst we kill the engine before we then reboot it to try and fix the system. I was like, great, I'm on a little metal bird that's about to travel through the air and the way you plan to fix the current problem is by switching it off and switching it back on again. <laughs> it's not a PlayStation. <laughs> some technical shit and that will reassure me. <laughs> I, I was kind of expecting him to say, oh yeah, it's going to be a couple of minutes more whilst we send the co-pilot out on the runway to see whether smacking it on the side will work. <laughs> and, actually, and it's a good point, I mean, how can it be fixed? You know how it can be fixed? Yeah, you need, you need a yeah, shim. You need a shim, you're absolutely yeah. right. Well, I like, look at it, look at the size of the shim. Wow. Right? And that's like, it's not like a chip or anything, that is just a small piece of metal. It's like, that would clearly, in a bag somewhere in the factory, mm. and they went, hey, what, what are these for? <laughs> <laughs> Part of it? Are they a thing? I don't know. Uh, great. Don't ask you... any questions, yeah. Terry. My, I'm, I'm really helpful. I'm pleased as well that my granny is going to be fine with this because she's one of those women. She's quite old-fashioned. She refuses to have any Japanese electronical equipment or anything in her house. And I asked my granny about this the other day, and I said, "Oh, is that because of the war?" She said, "No, she's just a massive racist." <laughs> Clear, though, isn't it? There, there was lots of column inches spent on what do you do if your accelerator stuck, and apparently the thing to do is to put your foot on the brake pedal. Yeah. <laughs> Who would have thought that? Right? <laughs> <laughs> the thing to do is the handbrake. We've all done that when you've got a crappy old car. Yeah. Just whoa, mm. and we're cooking. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> nothing worse when you're still accelerating and holding your handbrake. <laughs> <laughs> I used to own a Toyota years ago, and I remember once I was driving along eating a marshmallow, <laughs> and all of a sudden my airbag deployed. And in that moment, I thought I'd become really, really small. <laughs> Let's go to Jack here in Milton. <laughs> Our next round is called Newsreel. We play in a recent piece of footage featuring people in the news and ask you to suggest what might be being said. This week's clip features Peter Mandelson. Well, welcome, uh, uh, Lord Mandelson, to the new Labour uh, ele election uh, HQ. We've got everything that you asked for. We've got an area for phone polling, we've got an area for leaflets, we've got an area for envelope stuffing, and, of course, we have begun work, as requested, on the uh, machine. Oh? <laughs> the machine? When will it be finished? <laughs> well, we've we just started the installation. It should be ready by the middle of uh, next month. <laughs> 
Ah, as soon as that, that's beyond my wildest imagination. <laughs> Just one question, though. We're not, we're not quite sure. Well, you know, what is the uh, machine? The machine? Yeah, yes, it's, we never built one. So, uh, you know, what, what exactly does the machine... Let me explain. <laughs> the machine. Soon my enemies will be rounded up and fed into the machine. <laughs> it will suck their brains dry and I will be the most powerful politician in the world. <laughs> It's just a machine for sucking dry the brains of politicians. Is that how...? Yes. <laughs> and this is where I will watch it from. <laughs> Revenge will be mine, Harry Potter. Are you going to put glass in this? Only I don't want to get splashed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you. <laughs> now we play a round called Life is Like a Box of Mockalets. <laughs> This game involves Milton, Andy and Jax. If you could make your way over to the performance area, please. <laughs> this round is a stand-up challenge. I launch the Wheel of News and wherever it chooses to stop, one of our performers must step forward and talk about that subject. The winner is whoever I think is the funniest. OK, here we go. Our first topic, please. The first subject is education. Andy Parsons. Yes, well, I'd like to start off with arithmetic. And how come there's only one person on my team and two on theirs? <laughs> you may have seen, however, that there is a school in Tyneside which now doesn't open until 10am in the morning because they think teenagers need an extra hour and a half in bed to cope with puberty. <laughs> what a marvellous euphemism that is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> My mother burst into my room unexpectedly and caught me coping with puberty. <laughs> there have been a lot of teachers in the press recently, stories where they've been caught having sexual relationships with their pupil. The one that caught my eye, 26-year-old PE teacher who'd been caught shagging this 16-year-old lad. And the paper's going, oh, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked. I'm sure a question that a lot of people wanted to ask was, where was she when I was at school? <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy. OK, let's spin the wheel again. And the subject is media. Who wants to come in on that? Jack. <laughs> you hear the weirdest things on news reports. I was watching one a couple of months ago about the Californian forest fires. I genuinely heard a man say that apparently 300 mobile homes have been destroyed. Now, I don't know whether there are that many advantages to a mobile home, if any, but one of the main ones, the big selling point of the mobile home, <laughs> is that you're not really tied down to an area, <laughs> especially if the said area is on fire. <laughs> I also saw the most ludicrous one ever, which was a guy on the news, a so-called expert, say that apparently obesity is now a bigger threat to this country than Al-Qaeda. It's definitely not. <laughs> what would you rather have to obviously you on the train on your way home? Some mental guy with a beard and like a hundred yard stare with a rucksack full of Semtex? Or just a jolly little fat with a rucksack full of quavers? <laughs> um, you wrong, that's not me like belittling obesity, because actually my mum has quite a lot of issues with her weight. She, she uses those dieting pills, although I did have to point out to her the other day they don't work if you butter them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack. OK, Milton, let's see what you've been left with. Let's spin the wheel. And the topic is travel. <laughs> <laughs> I've just come back from Australia. While I was there, I learned some Aboriginal words like uh, boo, <laughs> which means to return, because uh, when you throw an ordinary meringue... <laughs> I didn't think much of the film on the plane coming back from Australia. It turned out to be a 24-hour animation of a plane travelling from Sydney to London. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you do, don't go and see Time to Destination. <laughs> Italians, slanty little eyes. <laughs> Sorry, italics. <laughs> mm. 
just come back from Dartmoor, where I spent three days shooting at life-size models of Sarah Ferguson and Princess Diana. <laughs> Got nothing against them myself, it's just they made it part of the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. <laughs> I've just come back from Russia. <laughs> Always wanted to go out with a Russian girl, because in my experience, inside every Russian woman, there's another Russian woman. <laughs> OK, point in that round. We're going to Milton and Jack. Come on back. The next round is called, if this is the answer, <laughs> what is the question on the board of six categories? Holly, which category would you like? Sport. Sport. Sport is the category. The answer is 12 minutes. What's the question? How long is too long a pause to say no after your girlfriend says, does my bum look big in this? <laughs> <laughs> is it if you push someone down the escalators at exactly the right speed, how long will they keep falling? <laughs> How long, on average, does it take an elderly woman to complete any kind of transaction at an ATM? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it when he looks back on his time in office, how much will Gordon Brown be proud of? <laughs> is it, if you break in a Toyota, how long till it stops? <laughs> Is it after how long of watching Paddy McGuinness's new dating show, Take Me Out, did I pray that the title had literal connotations? <laughs> <laughs> is it how long, are, how long after the wedding ceremony did Paul McCartney think, I've made a mistake? <laughs> is it what is a worryingly long time to be having a piss? Is it, what is the longest John Terry has kept in his pants? <laughs> is it it's not a million miles. It's uh, yeah. the time it took Fabio Capello to tell Terry that he'd been sacked. That's exactly it. Thank you very much, Russell. <laughs> the question I was looking for was, how long did it take England manager Fabio Capello to sack John Terry as captain? This is the news that during a 12-minute meeting, Terry was relieved of his captaincy and has been replaced by Rio Ferdinand. Was it the right decision? Um, yes. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Capello does come out of it well, doesn't he? I like the way he demanded that he wear a tie. Like, that's... They, the meeting was held up because he wasn't, he wasn't wearing, wearing a tie. tie like, yeah. you, you, like, you can do anything you like in the England squad, but only your sex can be casual. <laughs> <laughs> it was... The meeting... The meeting was a bit like a speed date, wasn't it? <laughs> one of them was being very critical, the other one was sensing rejection, and they both left without getting a shag. <laughs> <laughs> do you think Fabio missed a trick, though? You go, who is the New England captain? He should have gone, his name is Rio, and he dances on the <laughs> sand. <laughs> Twelve minutes is fast, given that half it had to be interpreted into Italian and then back out. That's like a six-minute meeting. Well, right. Then there's a hello. Then there's a kind of awkward pause where they go... <laughs> that Toyota thing is a bit of a mess, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> What's hilarious, though, you've just got people going, sacked as captain, he should be sacked from England. You're like, no, he shouldn't. He's really good at football. That's why he's going to stay. What, what's interesting about this, it makes you think Rooney could get away with anything. Could, yeah. He could eat a baby. <laughs> He could walk around Buckingham Palace naked and slap a swan with his wang and the Queen <laughs> would go, it's a World Cup year. Leave him to it, <laughs> Philip. <laughs> uh, I think it's a slightly unfortunate photograph as well. It looks like Fabio's going, and then he took her like this. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, that, maybe that's what the interview was. Maybe it was one minute going, you're sacked, and then the other 11. So tell me, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we don't was... leave out any details at all. <laughs> well, I think it's good for Terry as well, because Terry's like, he was quite a boring sportsman, and this has come out, it's like, mm, it's quite interesting. It's like the same as Tiger Woods. He was so dull, and then he did that, and I was like, mm, it's quite interesting now. I think more boring sportsmen should do it. Like, I would like Michael Owen far more if I found out he was into, like, badger baiting. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny you should say that. <laughs> they were actually chanting, though, at Chelsea, weren't they? They were going, there's only one England captain. The chant I thought they might have come up with was, Chelsea, wherever you may be, don't leave your wife with John Terry. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny, though, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? The idea that they've got rid of Terry because he's morally reprehensible and replaced him with Rio? That's yeah. like swapping a pit bull for a staffy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they've replaced a guy who shagged around on his wife yeah. with a man who's currently banned <laughs> for violent conduct on the field <laughs> for elbowing another footballer in the head. And the vice captain just got cleared uh, on an assault charge uh, <laughs> for punching a guy who he thought was attacking him when the guy was actually recoiling from being punched in the face by one of Gerard's friends. 
Or you could have got the guy whose marriage broke up with the good guy who went to the prostitute. Really, you shouldn't be picking your captains on a moral ground. See, it must be like a prison yard or somewhere like that. And when they're like, Theo Walcott in the middle of all that, they're going, what would you do? And he went, I just want to play football. Yeah. <laughs> what special service has the government shut down this week? This is oh, the swine, swine flu hotline. Swine flu hotline is gone. Yeah, if you any questions you want to ask, it's for the line. That moment has passed. Yeah. Now, yes. But basically, isn't it, we apparently mm. now have 60 million surplus vaccines that the NHS have, right? So you go and see your doctor now. Oh, doctor, I've broken my leg. Oh, here's some Tamiflu. <laughs> we need to get rid of it. Yeah. I'm going to miss it so much. I loved having fun with, like, swine flu. But the best is when you're on the tube, because if you coughed, anyone was just like, oh, God, we're going to die. <laughs> and everyone got really nervous and got off at the next stop. Like, even the Muslim extremists with the backpack were like, screw this shit, I'm out of here. <laughs> about that. When it first came out, I was thinking, how much fun would it be to go to the doctors just holding a pig wearing a sombrero? <laughs> <laughs> you get seen straight away. He's feeling snuffly. Thank you! <laughs> Can I just say, is, did anyone here have, have any experience of the uh, swine flu hotline? No, oh, do you know it was um, being manned by 16-year-olds? It yeah. was being manned how by 16 How fantastic is that? You don't want a 16-year-old kid diagnosing you. Yeah, I've got a rash on my breasts. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. If anyone knows how to get hold of drugs quickly, it's a 16-year-old. Yeah, I mean, they already have a distribution network, yeah. so they yeah. kind of got to do it. <laughs> I also... I, uh, I had to advertise it for a bit. Did you? Yeah. Well, I was th there were different voiceovers for different stages of the, of the pandemic. What did you so get? So there was... I think I was stage three. Ooh. And Ooh. stage one was, you know, there is just normal seasonal flu. Yeah. And then stage four was, you know, you're going to die, you're going to die. I was stage three, which was... If pandemic flu reaches Britain, they missed that stage out completely. <laughs> what, did we go straight to the you're we going to die, to you're, you're going to die, you're going to die? I don't remember seeing the ads that went, I... you're going to die, you're going yeah. to die. But now, so on the one hand, yeah. I was terrified, and on the other hand, I was thinking, I haven't been paid. They've missed out on my... <laughs> <laughs> did you see the advert? It's hilarious, right? The, ad the official government um, advert, there's a bloke in a lift with a family, the family having an amazing time, yeah. where... Then the bloke sneezes, and there's a shot of the baby looking at the man going... <laughs> <laughs> Child is going to go. How could you? Might that kill him? <laughs> you don't want sixteen-year-olds handing out advice for health, though, do you? You know, you phone up the hotline. You go, "Oh, I'm pale. I feel awful. I've got no energy." Sixteen-year-olds are going, "Well, you're probably a goth." <laughs> <laughs> Can I just go back to this? I'm sorry, I'm intrigued by this. I'm intrigued by the fact that in a time of pandemic and crisis, Hugh Dennis was cashing in, first. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> was but also was the voice that we were supposed that. to be reassured by. Which of I your was. voices did you do for this? Yeah, which one? Hmm. The prince Stay at the... home. Lock your doors. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. We can't tell you when. It's <laughs> uh, actually only weird. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the problem is people don't understand disease. When, when AIDS first became a crisis, I was working operating the goods lift in Harrods. I was a student, I was trying to earn money. And the only thing we knew about AIDS was they knew it started in Holland, right? And the bloke who operated the goods lift with me refused to unload a consignment of E-Dam cheese. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of that round, the point's going to Russell, Holly and Andy! <laughs> now we've come to scenes we'd like to see, so if everyone can make their way to the performance area, please, I'll read out this week's topics and then we'll see what our panels can come up with. <laughs> OK, here we go. The first subject is... Unlikely things to read in a Valentine's Day card. I may be dyslexic, but that doesn't mean I don't vol you. <laughs> <laughs> Roses are red, violets are blue. I've got something nasty, and now so do you. You make me so hot, I can't stop thinking about you. Lots of love, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day on this 24th of February. Love, Royal Mail. <laughs> <laughs> You're the perfect person for me. Pissed and gagging for it. <laughs> Be my Valentine or die in a well. I love your eyes, I love your nose, I love your smell. Why must you be a Labrador? <laughs> Do we have to go through this shit every year? <laughs> you make my pants hot. Yours, Omar Farouk Abdul Mutalab. <laughs> 
to my darling wife. Roses are red, violets are blue. Valentine's Day is consumerist bullshit. Now, haven't you got some ironing to do? <laughs> Roses are red, poppies are red, the grass is all red. Shit, the garden's on fire! <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit of a man for the ladies. Doesn't matter how clearly the gents are signposted. <laughs> I love you so much. I love you like no other. But never again les up with my mother. <laughs> Life with me, baby, is like a roller coaster. It's got a weight restriction. <laughs> <laughs> there are just three words I want to say. Dream on, bitch. <laughs> OK, next topic is on life with you here in the science programme. 1643. The cold air balloon is invented. <laughs> but it doesn't really take off. For Einstein, it was easy to choose a DJ name. He would be MC Squared. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Dr Gillian McKeith, and today I'll be sifting through your poop. Why? <laughs> because I was never hugged as a child. <laughs> <laughs> now on five, crop circles, myth or bollocks? <laughs> Next, to demonstrate chaos theory, we've locked Boris Johnson in a room with an aardvark and some magic mushrooms. <laughs> I was the man who discovered DNA. I wasn't going to call it that, but I was giving a lecture to the Royal Society, and I said, gentlemen, I believe I've discovered the genetic fingerprint of all human life. Ta-da! <laughs> I've been Richard Dawkins. Good night and God bless. <laughs> Shit! <laughs> Thanks to carbon dating, this skeleton is now going out with a short-sighted geology student who likes thin people that don't talk much. <laughs> 1891. Sir Alexander Graham Benn receives the first wrong number telephone call. <laughs> He realised that this equation was going to take him absolutely years. So he switched to a media studies course, which was a piece of piss. <laughs> I did have here a pie chart to demonstrate obesity. Uh... <laughs> Apart from the human, the only animal to enjoy having sex is a dolphin. I had to shag a lot of animals to find that out. <laughs> I'm a meerkat, she's not lying. <laughs> Tonight we'll be discussing molecular science. Our guests are Sir Patrick Moore, Robert Winston and Dappy off of N-dubs. <laughs> With their tiny arms, could the T-Rex self-pleasure? Let's find out in another edition of Wanking with Dinosaurs. <laughs> At the end of that round, the point is going to Russell, Holly and Andy. <laughs> That's the end of the show. This week's winners are Jack Whitehall, Hugh Dennis and Midson Jones. <laughs> Commiserations to Andy Parsons, Holly Walsh and Russell Howard. <laughs> Thank you for watching. I'm Gary Green. Good night. Comedy continues here on BBC Two as Rapsi Nesbitt is left more than a little confused by a love triangle. That's next. <laughs>